Today, global climate change on Earth is an obvious fact. Catastrophic increase in seismic activity. The number of awakening volcanoes reaches a critical point. The continental line of Antarctica is completely changing due to the constant and rapid melting of glaciers. Tornadoes and hurricanes, floods. Yes, the Earth is on the verge of global climate change, it is a fact. But what does modern human know about this? What do they say about this in the scientific world? What role does humanity itself play in these processes? We invite you to investigate this together. The report on the problems and consequences of global climate change on Earth. This is the ultimate reality of today. We can only state the fact that the events described in the report are becoming the reality within the specified time frame. In fact, humankind has been less than 50 years. About 12,000 years ago, global cataclysms occurred on Earth, the result of which was catastrophic. To date, there is a lot of evidence of these events. If the, the orientation of the Earth were to flip at the same time that the magnetic field did, then there wouldn't be a record in the geology of it having flipped. The Egyptians say that three times in their memory, their cultural memory, the sun rose where it formerly set. In China, there are statements also, clear, uh, overt statements about uh, changes in where the sun rose, that it would be, um, the sun would be obscured for a period of days uh, there are there are reports of um, the emperor calling together all of his advisors to to estimate where the sun will rise the next time it appears. Um, in one case, they said no one guessed that it would be in the east. <laughs> mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now, what those effects are, it's, it's hard to tell. We know that we have examples of great woolly mammoths in Siberia, mm -hmm. where the animal was frozen so quickly. Mm -hmm that the meat was still edible by dogs when it was um, thawed um, millennia later. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that um, in some cases they found the last meal of the, of the mastodon in the stomach of the, the carcass, mm -hmm. undigested. Mm -hmm. Now this implies that it's a very quick process. It could be a very smooth, quick roll uh, that's the sort of, uh, now other indications that that happens, there are um, primordial forests, petrified primordial forests at the South Pole that you shouldn't be able to grow with the amount of sunlight that, it, that persists there. This, these are the forests of the sort that um, the explorers Lewis and Clark found on the west coast of the United States when they first arrived there. This, these are primordial stands of trees. So, the implication is that Antarctica hasn't always been located in relation to the equator where it is now. Vladimir Vasilievich Bubionkov studied the Earth's development cycles such as astrophysical, geological, biological, and historical ones. It turned out that they are all subject to the great cycle of the change of epochs lasting 11,911 years. This number is a multiple of the periods of rotation around the Sun of all its planets with an accuracy of hundredths of an Earth year. Alexander Mikhailovich Baturin, I affirm that the planets also rotate around their center of mass in a direction perpendicular to the plane of their orbit. As a result of such rotation, the planet Earth periodically turns over in space by 360 angular degrees, which causes the cyclical nature of global events. Global catastrophes with a frequency of 12,166 years. Periodically, the whole face of the Earth and environmental conditions change, which directly affects the historical development of mankind. Igor Petrovich Kapilov, Vitaly Vasilevich Boshuyev. Small 13,000 galactic half cycles are also associated with global climate change and other catastrophic events, but they pass without changing the polarity of the magnetic field. The boundaries of these cycles are clearly evidenced by rising sea levels and global climate change. These events are called the Great Flood. Modern science has no doubts that there was the Great Flood. 
this event remained in the memory of the peoples and is noted in the Bible, as well as in ancient legends and myths. The last flood was in the 11th millennium BC. If we add 2,000 years of our era to that number, now is the time for the new great flood. Today, one of the interesting and important cycles is the precession cycle, which is formed by swaying the axis of rotation of our planet, as a result of which the axis of rotation makes a full circle in the star sky. The rotation speed is 1 degree in 72 years, respectively, a full circle is 25,920 years. Let's look at what a precession looks like for an observer from the Earth. Since ancient times, the most obvious and understandable way has been to observe the precession cycle by means of the star sky, or rather, to observe the change of the eras. This method was well known to ancient people who had voluminous and holistic picture of the world order. Graham Hancock and we can't but recall that the pyramids and the sphinx seem to be specially conceived to bring us to the understanding of the grandiose changes that the heavens undergo during the long procession cycle. Let's move to Egypt, to the oldest monumental sculpture of the Great Sphinx. How is it oriented? Sphinx looks exactly to the east, which is remarkable about this orientation. The sun rises precisely in the east only twice a year on the days of the equinoxes. We can say that the Sphinx always looks at the point of the vernal equinox on the celestial sphere, being a symbolic expression of this phenomenon. Now let's see what the sky looks like at the dawn of the vernal equinox at the present time, at the turn of the 21st century. We will see that the sun rises between the constellations Pisces and Aquarius. At the same time, we know that today, we are exactly on the threshold of the era of Aquarius. If we move back in time to 2160 years ago, we will see a slightly different picture of the star horizon in the east. Our celestial body will shift and rise between the constellation of Aries and Pisces. Another 2160 years ago, we'll see the gap between Taurus and Aries, and so on. Thus, the precession of the Earth's axis makes the sunrise migrate on the day of the vernal equinox along the zodiac circle changing epochs. Where did these 2160 years come from? The fact is that a full circle or passage of the celestial body through 12 regions of the sky through all the constellations of the zodiac signs is exactly the cycle of precession which lasts 25,920 years in total, where one era lasts about 2,160 years respectively. There is another convincing argument the result of a truly titanic work of an epoch-making scale, where ancient people depicted the procession in religious architectural buildings on Earth. The Egyptian pyramids and the Angkor Wat complex is the so-called heavenly clock indicating the times of the crossroads, the global choice of civilization known today to many as the pendulum of Orion and Draco. In order to begin to review them, we will remain there on the Egyptian plateau of Giza, having shifted the observation point to the large pyramids. The pyramids, Giza. The unique geometry and proportions of these highly engineered buildings for millennia attracted the attention of ordinary inquisitive people, historians, archaeologists, physicists, astronomers, architects, and others. Today, the pyramids are the subject of many studies and scientific discussions. Though built in different times, they were located in strictly determined coordinates with strict orientation in the time of building at certain stars. Globally, it is a kind of a map. Initiators of creation of such pyramids were people who possess this knowledge. 
Imhotep was one of them. It's interesting that in the program Breaking the Laws of Physics, when a question about the pyramids was asked, you gave the following answer. I'd like to read it out loud. You said that this apparatus actually provides an understanding of what the pyramids were needed for. Can we at least give more details about these complexes? Well, I will reply with a question to start with. May I? What do you think? Did Imhotep build a pyramid for his descendants to organize tourism there and for his country to make money on it? Or for some other reason? And how many such pyramids were built all over the world? Yes, and they keep discovering them. After all, there exist much bigger pyramids, and all of them are built in a certain, let's say, in a certain sequence. And all of them are oriented towards Mount Kailash. Mm -hmm. Why does this pyramidal complex exist? Has anyone wondered why? What for? Apparently, for something more than mere tourism, right? Pyramids are among the most mysterious structures on the planet. Around the world, on all continents, from America to Europe, from Australia to Africa and Asia, hundreds of pyramidal stone structures have been found. Regular pyramids, truncated pyramids, stepped pyramids, and pyramidal mountain complexes. Multitone structures, unique megalithic masonry, precise orientation to the cardinal points, Pyramids, the construction of which required tremendous amount of force, time and resources, as well as knowledge of exact sciences. The pyramids continue to be found to this day. Some are hidden under the sands, others under the ground. The third ones became overgrown with forests. The fourths are hidden underwater. But there is one thing which is common about them. These unique grand objects were built in ancient times and represent a single global complex linked to Kailash. And this raises many questions, the main of which is, for what purpose? Why were people willing to go to such enormous expense? It's clear that it was done for something global and super important that concerns all humankind. But this raises another question. How does it work? However, humanity has yet to answer these questions. At the end of the previous century, Robert Buell, as a civil engineer, accidentally discovered that the three pyramids in Giza are the projection of the belt of the constellation Orion on Earth. Further, in the course of his searches, thanks to an astronomical computer program, he calculated the position of the stars of Orion for different eras of the procession. By the way, the belt of Orion itself consists of three stars, Al-Nitak, Al-Nilam, and Mintaka. The three pyramids of Giza correspond to them, where the largest, the Pyramid of Cheops, displays the star Al-Nitak. Despite the fact that the Egyptian pyramids themselves, as you know, were built 4,500 years ago, they were built at this place and in this location not by accident, and since the buildings were a projection of the star sky, Robert Bouvel was able to find the keys to this riddle. Here is what he writes in his book. In 10,450 BC, and only then, the location of the pyramids on Earth accurately reflects the location of the stars in the sky. I mean the perfect, unmistakable match, and this cannot be accidental. So the Egyptian pyramids reflect the sky of the year 10,450 BC. What is it? An accident? Or maybe a regularity? A fine-tuned way to designate an era, freeze a specific date in architecture. To understand this issue, let's see how the constellation Orion behaves on the day of the vernal equinox during the complete procession cycle of 26,000 years. The constellation Orion, like other visible stars, gradually changes 
the height due to the swaying of the Earth's axis, the precession. Let's look at how this happens. The star Al Nittak from the constellation Orion rises and falls every 12 and a half thousand years. The lowest point is a mark in 10,450 BC, or about 12 and a half thousand years ago. Now let's go higher and have a look. Now the star is at its highest point. This cycle is repeated 12 and a half thousand years up, 12 and a half thousand years down up and down. The extreme points coincide with the times of the crossroads. Now let's move 72 degrees to the east of Giza, to the largest of all religious buildings ever created on earth, the temple complex of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Its construction was started by the founder of the Angkor dynasty, the Hindu prince Jahavarman II, in the 9th century. It lasted about 400 years. The last temple complexes were erected in the 12th century by King Jahavarman VII. In 1996, a British archaeologist and historian, John Grigsby, while exploring Angkor Wat, came to the conclusion that the temple complex is an earth projection of a certain section of the star sky, where the main buildings of Angkor model the outlines of the constellation Draco. And the exact match falls on the date of the vernal equinox at the year of 10,500 BC. That is, the date immortalized by the Egyptian pyramids in their unique architecture. Why and what for? To figure this out, we will use the Stellarium program and model the change in the scar sky over many thousands of years. For the observation point, we again choose Egypt. Now we are in Giza, near the Great Sphinx, 12,500 years ago, and observe what people of the previous civilization saw while being here on the morning of the vernal equinox. When the sun rises in the east, we see how the constellation Orion rises in the south, the star al Nittak reaches its culmination. At the same time, on the opposite side of the observer, in the north, we zoom in, we see the constellation Draco is in the highest position. To compare the ascending heights of Orion and Draco, we combine the cardinal points in the program and see that Orion is below and Draco is above. We remove the atmosphere, to check the assumption regarding the relationship of these constellations and precession, let's do the experiment several times at different dates with a time interval of 12 to 13,000 years. Observing the sky on the vernal equinox, we notice that every 12,500 years when the constellation Orion occupies the highest position, the constellation Draco at the same time occupies the lowest position. But after the next 12,500 years, the situation changes to the opposite. Orion is down while Draco is up, creating a kind of pendulum. The extreme position of which clearly indicates half the precession cycle. The pendulum in the extreme positions of which global cataclysms occur on the planet, changing the climate throughout the Earth for long periods of time. If we just look, what we talked about God knows when, and what for some reason was not taken into account, all this will develop in this cyclical process at a tremendous speed, in a crazy progression, and this is happening. Now we… I also came across an article that at the end of this century, the sea level will probably rise by one meter. Guys, God grant that at the end of this century there will be at least some kind of, let's say so, an eyelid of life, an eyelid of life on this planet. That would be wonderful. As we see from the experience of past generations and past civilizations, the cyclicity exists. Many scientists today confirm this. Therefore, knowing the past, we can understand how to act in the present. I'd like to um, point the attention to the Bosnian Pyramid Project and the work of Dr. Sam Osmanagic. This pyramid was not well known for a while because it's got trees growing on it. 
which speaks to the idea that it would have been before the flood and the last flood in the Younger Dryas uh, and that the silt would have covered the pyramid and then when the water receded there was enough soil to then grow trees and trees were all different heights that the stones were poured so they're like a concrete cement it's special that's actually stronger than um, anything we've got now but between the third and fourth course of these stones a leaf blew in and they actually did a carbon 14 date on it and i saw the dating certificate for the age of the pyramid and it would have been necessarily during the construction was 38,000 years ago okay so this is real science now this is curious because they decommissioned them before the last flood like they buried Gobleki Tepe near the Syrian border in Turkey before the flood both of them which means the structures are much older they try to say that Gobleki Tepe is 13,000 years old, much older than that. Uh, it was a ceremonial site, it wasn't a dwelling. Uh, there was something very, very strategic about it. But someone must have known the flood was coming or they wouldn't have decommissioned this. There are many, 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 many underwater uh, places, even the Bimini Road. And so those, they again, they want to say that they're natural but if you really examine it, you can see that it's a, it's a, it has to be man-made because of the scattering of stones that are around it. And I went down underwater and looked for myself. Java, where the river systems that used to exist there are exactly, and the size of the, uh, the high plateau and the wrapping of the mountains around and the elephants and the coconuts and the exotic wood and the precious metals and precious jewels all exist in Java underwater. There's a whole structure at Yanaguni uh, at the southern point of Okinawa, which is the south part of uh, Japan, which is actually the north part of Taiwan. And from the north of Taiwan, you can see Okinawa. And so that's what I was speaking to before about that all those could have been connected. And there is a huge uh, development there. There's staircases and archways and pyramid-like structure, and it goes on and on. I mean, you can't possibly see it all in one dive, but um, there's absolutely no possible way that it's natural. So that would be a flooded underwater city. Is there any confirmation of global climate change in terms of archaeological finds, history? I would like to tell you from the perspective of speleology about one interesting, mysterious archaeological find, the age of which was determined using the speleothene, that is, stalactite. And it was a stalactite that traced a date well for such a climatic catastrophe as a flood. Megalithic underwater structures near Yanagumi Island Japan were named the Yanagumi Monument or the Yanagumi Pyramids, which are located at a depth of 25 meters underwater and were discovered by scuba divers in the middle of 1980s. And there were disputes if those buildings were man-made or if they were a natural phenomenon and what age they are. There is an opinion that Teruaki Ishii, a professor of geology at the University of Tokyo, adheres to that the terraces went underwater at the end of the the last ice age, and that is more than 10,000 years ago, and near this monument, a cave with stalactites was found, and it's currently flooded. It is known that stalactites grow only on the mainland. Scientists have found that stalactite groves stopped when the cave was flooded with water, and this happened no less than 10,000 years ago. That means stalactites ceased to form no less than 10,000 years ago. It turns out that this was a time of flooding of this mainland, of this monument, and this also corresponds to scientists' estimates regarding changes in the sea level. It turns out that stalactite as a natural chronicler, sort of a natural archive, recorded the date of a climatic catastrophe, such as a flood. Water damage 
if you pour water over limestone, soft stone, it makes rivulets that get deeper and deeper and deeper with more water. Wind damage um, kind of erodes a stone in a different way. Like if you were literally putting a leaf blower on and, and then, then it, it kind of hollows things out. And so you can see that it, it becomes more porous. Uh, so it's, it's quite evident if you stand there, and I've stood there a lot, uh, that you can see flooding damage around the Sphinx. Absolutely, this has been demonstrated, it's been shown scientifically, this is a fact, that uh, it, there, there's flood damage around the Sphinx. And so when we look at these different star maps, it's almost like the knowledge from the ancients that had been destroyed that looks like they went back to caveman days was basically really intelligent people who were putting things back together after a really big disaster. So, if everything crashed right now and we went back to primitive times and went to live in caves because we needed to make a fire and keep hot and warm, it doesn't mean we didn't have cell phones two days before. We just lost all the stuff because of the disaster. So yes, there's evidence of disasters and it takes a while to piece this glorious puzzle together. Let's summarize it. Everything in nature is repeated cyclically both in space and on Earth. The pendulum, as we saw on the chart, periodically takes extreme positions. Its oscillation period is about 12,500 years. The previous time of the extreme position of the pendulum coincides with the time of the Great Flood, the time of the crossroads for the previous civilization, Atlantis. Now we are again in the extreme position of the pendulum and this means that the time of the crossroads has already come. And, excuse me, what have we observed this year? How really catastrophically the water level has lowered. Yes, in all rivers. In the rivers. Right. In the lakes, in the rivers. This happens, excuse me, basically all over the world. Despite the fact that somewhere there are floods, somewhere in Dubai, they were flooded not so long ago, and the like. In other words, somewhere there is too much water, while somewhere there is no water at all. But everyone all over the world basically observes that the water level is decreasing. This is physics. There is a lot of water underground, no less than on the surface. But for some reason they count only the water which is on the surface. And therefore, in order for such a great flood, the deluge, as they call it, to occur, the ice must melt, the level will rise. Guys, but hasn't anyone got alarmed that water disappears somewhere? And for what reason? Despite the ice is melting. Well, the ice is melting, yes. there should be... the water drains exactly. away, it should be the other way around. An increase, yet water drains away, Entire certainly. Entire rivers drain away and disappear. From time immemorial, it has been mentioned that the Earth is breathing, that it has a tendency to slightly expand and then contract. It's again one of those stages of these climate changes. This suggests that the problem is taking place inside the planet itself. This trouble is quite serious. And since water decreases, and it goes into the ground, it will soon come out of it in much larger volumes. It's like, you know, when the tsunami is approaching. Prior to tsunami, water in an ocean recedes from the coast. It doesn't recede much, but then it goes much farther than it has receded. Well, that's roughly what we encounter. And at this point, we really need to unite. And the most interesting thing is that there are attempts. For many years now, we have been saying that humanity must unite. Many do not understand what for, how, what can we do being united. We can do a lot, my friends. We can change the world, we can save humanity, or we can slide into chaos. But having united, we can really save humankind. I think this is extremely important. Today, as never before, we are not just eyewitnesses, but also direct participants of the events. Therefore, each of us is responsible for the survival of all mankind. Already now, Alatra platform hosts international conferences such as Games of Professionals on the topic of economics, medicine, psychology, climate and physics in different parts of the world during which people from all over the world come together to solve pressing issues concerning each of us and all humanity as a whole. 
These are people from different countries, of different professions, of different social status, of different nationalities and races, of different faiths and atheistic views. All of them are united by a common ideology of life in the spiritual and moral vector of their development, understanding the importance of the here and now action in building a creative society where love, peace, friendship, kindness, humanity reign all over the world. This is our chance, our common chance, whether we use it or not depends on each of us, and, in this case, on every single one of us. Now, one person can really do a lot. A simple example, if you, my friend, have decided that this doesn't concern you and this is all ravings, then we, the remaining society, can do a lot less without you than with you. And this is true. 